issues that bother the world right now, and we still don't have answers on our questions, what's, what is going to happen in a few days, in a few hours, actually. So it will, be, it will be really interesting conversation today because we are having very interesting guests uh, coming uh, here to Tbilisi to sit on our panel and discuss the key points. And also we will have online engagements. Uh, and before we start our uh, conference, I would li like to ask Ms. Kihuli Alessania to uh, make a few opening remarks, and then the president of Georgia, Georgi Margulashvili. I'm here just to be seen for everyone. And uh, it's the third uh, conference like this, which is dedicated to the topical uh, issues. Uh, after the Cold War, security system was not created in the world. Nobody is safe in turbulence emerging from time to time. We passed the Arab Spring and its consequences. Turkey's Syria war and its consequences. The world once again finds itself at a major crossroads. In rapidly changing world, some old tenets at the basis of East-West relations are finally rejected. Others, which have proven their value, are being reconfirmed, and new paradigms are born. Presently, Ukraine is playing the role of system-creating factor in this matter. One, Russian idea that war is sometimes the cheapest and most convincing instrument to retain, if not global, at least regional superpower status, was soundly defeated. Two, the most famous sleeping beauty, NATO, regained its original function to be a protector and a active promoter of core Western values and freedoms not an aggressor military bloc, as some countries are trying to portray. Three, the process of re-evaluation of post-Second World was borders, war borders in Europe, as well as post-war social political realities in general, which started with the Russian invasion in Georgia that was in early 90s and later in 2008 continued with the occupation of Crimea in uh, 2014, bloody events in Eastern Ukraine, and recent military incursion deep into Kazakhstan cannot be tolerated by international community and would not inspire support even from Russia's most ardent all forgiving giving allies. Four, the new correlation of military political forces is attaining clearly defined contours in Europe. Five, although political dialogue still remains a preferred path, there is a newfound resolve to closely examine other non-political tools of diplomacy, such as economic, financial, and trade embargoes, etc. At the same time, would community overwhelmingly supports military vigilance to dissuade adversary from overestimating their strengths and to cool down few hot heads who are prone to test the mental toughness of the Western alliance. Six, of course, the shifting paradigms are not limited to the above. The world definitely needs a comprehensive review of fundamental ongoing processes based on an in-depth SAR analysis. And conferences like this one are a precise venue to put in one room an intellectual repository capable of serving this purpose. I wish the participants success in their work and hope that this day will give us 
pass into the future and clear vision of what the world should and could be for the betterment of all humankind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask Mr. Georgi Margolashvili, the president of Georgia, to give us his own ideas. Thank you. Honorable guest, Madam Founder, Giulia Lasagne, let me welcome you on this very important event, which has been sponsored by University of Georgia, UG Security Platform, M Embassy of France, and In Institute Francis. Uh, as, uh, uh, as it was mentioned, <clears throat> this, is, was a, this is a very important event and a very timely event, uh, an event that uh, we should have more of such meetings and intensi intensified dialogues because I believe and I feel that we are in a very challenging times at, at which point these kind of discussions create the backbone of our national security and uh, uh, our sovereignty. I would like to applaud to the to people who have uh, actually put the put the text here, lesson learned, and have used the questions question mark uh, in 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 this uh, in this in this heading. Actually, this question mark was basically a uh, daily uh, or a regular question mark that I was I had to put within my meetings with uh, our international partners for the last five years of my service. Uh, we had uh, to notify when we were discussing with our friends and allies that Georgia has been an uh, object of Russian occupation in 2008. And uh, where did we learn our lessons uh, till 2014 where Russians have basically repeated the scenario that they have uh, done in Georgia, but more swiftly, more readily, and with, uh, with unfortunately, with uh, with the effect of uh, uh, annexation of Ukraine and occupation of parts of the, uh, annexation of uh, Crimea and parts of the uh, eastern Ukraine. And this question mark, uh, basically I had to question this, put this question mark at every meeting that we were having with our partners and allies. Uh, though I don't think that the relevance of this question mark is still lost, and unfortunately the question mark still stays there. Did we learn our lesson, lessons from, <clears throat> from the aggressive politics of Russia and the Russia's uh, president, Vladimir Putin, and are we ready to be resilient to the plans, uh, plans of, this, uh, of, of this kind of destabilization of the security environment in the region and in Europe. So what is resilience to which we are discussing and searching for? Basically, it's an ability to be robust in a crisis, to be ready for the crisis and be able to recover from the crisis in a, in a, in a swift mode and be ready to, ready to start rebuilding your, your normal uh, within, within this process, within the process of, uh, within the, process of the calamities. Uh, but what constitutes this readiness? What constitutes this ability? I believe it constitutes of several factors uh, first of all, it is being ready for the challenges, and the challenges is the way our world operates. We as human beings basically live in, a, in an unstable, unpredictable environment, especially in this region. So being ready for a changing environment and being ready to respond to those change, uh, challenges and changes is pretext to being uh, resilient. 
uh, ability to analyze and predict as well as ability to be uh, to activate your secure, security and uh, crisis mechanisms when the uh, crisis approaches you. So let us very shortly, within this context, analyze the situation now on the ground. I mean, in Georgia and around us. First of all, I believe that the free world, together with the, the countries that are in a thrive to become the country part of this free, wor free world, had a very difficult two or three years, especially now during the COVID. But even worse uh, previous year, specifically for Georgia and specifically for the Russian neighborhood. West has, the free world, the West has sort of lost the lead of the process in this, in this, in this region, if not, uh, or if not global. And it started with a very pitiful, pro, uh, with, with a very pitiful process of giving Russia ability to develop, further develop North Stream 2, which is now considered to be one of the most real pretexts to why Russia is able to be now so aggressive with the Ukraine and we, why we have a sort of a weaker ability of resilience within our, within our allies. So the Nord Stream 2 was a strange, very strange, unexplained start for the Russia's, Russia's uh, for giving Russia ability to become more active and become more more, more, more confident in what they are doing. Then it was continued with a catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, and Afghanistan was a, was a war that had basically no solution, and we all understand that. Dozens of Georgian soldiers have left their lives together with our allies. They fought there bravely together with our allies, and they gave their life to this cause tens and probably hundreds of people, more than hundreds of people have lost their health there. And these were Georgians that were fighting for Georgia, for fighting for the common cause. But, and we knew that the war could not, uh, could not be, there was no very perfect solution. But the solution with which Afghanistan ended uh, was a big blow for everyone who participated in this war and everyone who, uh, and, and it gave the upper hand for countries who confront the free world to be sort of more uh, confident in their ability to challenge our allies. And but basically this continued with that catastrophic uh, uh, military buildup in Ukraine and political positioning behind this buildup we should understand that what Russia is demanding from NATO is basically politically destroying the morale of the alliance. It's not, <clears throat> it's not a discussion which we, which for instance I was used to listening in when I was a kid to these discussions on, on the different ways of disarmament in, in Europe, on different ways of lowering the tension of uh, military buildup. This was during the Soviet Union. And that's something that we are used to when we are think, uh, hearing of this. But this, in, uh, about let's reduce the arms, et cetera, et cetera. But this uh, ultimatum that Russia has given to, uh, to our allies in free world and in NATO to just politically dismantle NATO's uh, moral backbone, saying that they have to write what, what Russia decides that they have, to, they have to put in writing, is absolutely terrible. and. Uh, in this context, uh, and in, especially in the context of disarmament, I want to note that basically our allies, especially UK and the US, have a special uh, stand in this position because even beyond NATO, since the decision of 1994, when Ukraine has disarmed its, its nuclear arsenal, they have committed to territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And we are talking about an unprecedented move in 
maybe in the world history where, where a country takes away its basic military capabilities for the sake of peace, and in 20 years, they are occupied partly, but occupied by one of the countries signing this agreement. So basically 2020 was, uh, 2021 was a, was a serious blow on our ability to be, to be more strong and resilient in, in context of aggressive and totalitarian uh, cases around the world. But even further, uh, I, it's even further worse because Russia, the main adversary for Georgia, is on its high move not for uh, only for last year, but for the year before as well. Uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani conflict. Aside from all the details that was happening in there, and Georgia always supported peace between these two brotherly nations, but as, 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 a, as a consequence of the process and as, as a summary of the process, we have Russian military bases in Azerbaijan. So if we are looking at this situation, we have we had Russian presence. We have Russian presence in Armenia. We have Russian military presence in Azerbaijan, and we have Russian military presence on the occupied territories of Georgia. So Russia in the Caucasus is much stronger since 2020, as well as Russia became much more stronger in Belarus since, since 2020 and 21. It was already mentioned about their activities, uh, activities in, in the areas which they call their uh, neighborhood, their closer neighborhood. These issues are becoming more and more dangerous. And of course, the summary of this process is within the Ukraine. What is even more bothering in this case is the ability of Russia to proceed with its propaganda effectively. As much as we dislike Russian propaganda and Russia, Russian press pressure on, on, on us and our allies and our neighbors, we cannot underestimate their ability to be clear in their messaging. Their ability to put their words, or how is that expression, to put your actions where their words are, or to, to be consistent with what they are doing. And how, how can this be compared with the with the, uh, with, with the messaging of our allies who shy away from a very clear aggression of, of, uh, of Russia in the region, who try to, to understand, to legitimize, to um, have empathy uh, with, with an aggressor. And I'm talking from the real context. I'm talking from real comments of, of some of the politicians in our, in our, within our allies. Putin has a stress after the uh, after destruction of Soviet Union. So going into psychology of Putin, and maybe it's interesting for some psychologists, for me as a psychologist, this is not interesting, but for someone might, it might be interesting. But to put it in a political context, that there is a reasoning behind this, that there is a reasoning be behind this imperial thinking that there is a, a certain security that Russia is seeking in respect vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Uh, this messaging, messaging that we are not really going to consider. We, we, it was not on the table to consider Georgians and Ukraine's NATO membership. So why are you pressing on us this kind of dialogue with, with an aggressor? Messaging that there can be a minor incursion it, of course, is, uh, is in a conflict with a very consistent and clear messaging from Kremlin in which they are together with their actions. And this has to be acknowledged and uh, I hope has to be improved. So in this cause of environment where our allies are not in the grip of situation, in the cause of the environment where our enemy and foe is on the rise. What are the abilities and possibilities for Georgia resilience, which has been a backbone of our national identity for the centuries? I believe here we also don't have very promising <coughs> picture. First of all, for the resilience, you need an organized trust 
of the institutions that are going to be activated during the, during the crisis process. This is the government. Now we can say that the trust to government is on a, unfortunately on a very low scale. The trust to the government that has not, we have not reached the trust in the parliamentary elections, we have not reached the trust in the local government elections, we have decreased the trust to the organizing institutions during the COVID process. So in case of calamities, the trust that government is able to give you a very specific and very concrete indications of what, who has to be doing. It might be, and especially in the case where the, with the new constitution, the Security Council has been basically destroyed. It's very low. But even further, the happiness index in Georgia, among Georgian population, the willingness to continue your life and career in Georgia versus go away and, for instance, go away for working, to work in Germany or in France or, 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 or leave, leave Georgia for the better good. This level is extremely high. So the readiness of our society for the, uh, for the crisis and ability to swiftly and in an organized way respond to this crisis. Unfortunately, it does not also give, uh, is given in a good parameter. Well, there is always, especially in Georgian case and in other, in cases of these uh, nations like Georgia who has gone through much more problematic past, there is always this mystic element, or maybe not even mystic, but the backbone of our identity that we are going to fight and be resilient like our ancestors did. And fortunately, this is how our nation has survived through even much more complicated times. But I believe this should not give us a feeling that we are in a good spot right now and we are safe right now. But on the contrary, we should be feeling that the tanks that are started at the Ukraine border are in a sequence and are in harmony and are coordinated with the tanks that are standing in, in our occupied territories. And this is the unified process. The war in Ukraine is a war in Georgia and it cannot be separated. As we have seen those scenarios, they just, they just flip. Once it happens in Ukraine, the other time it happens in Georgia, the third time it happens in Moldova or happens uh, in other parts of the Russian spheres of influence. So uh, to put it short, I want to welcome all you, once more express uh, my appreciation to the organizers and the participants of the conference and wish that you come up with uh, clear and uh, interesting solutions to these very com complicated challenges that has been put uh, before us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And it was really good that you noticed this question mark because this question mark applies to everything and everybody in today's world. And as a Georgian, what I learned about security and defense, it is that uh, uh, not law, but power and politics shape the situation, which is very bad because we are out of the legislative system uh, as a Georgian, as, a, as uh, I can talk as a, as a Ukrainian as well today, because we, we know that the threats that are coming for both of us is like a game who is going to blink the first. And this game is still continuing and we don't know how, how it's going to end. Therefore, I would like to invite our panelists to elaborate more about their topics and make it clear how, how the resilience could be applied and what sort of lessons we have learned and what we are going to learn in the future, for the future, and if there is a chance to learn anything. This is also a question uh, according to our, uh, our past. What we have done, what we have, uh, how we have evaluated our security and defense situation. Uh, I would like to invite on the panel Dr. Karl Heinzkamp, who is uh, representing the Ministry of Defense of Germany, our distinguished guest. And uh, Dr. Karl, please, the floor is yours. No, 
want to stand up here, because we're late. It's up to you. You're the boss. Don't you care? Okay. First of all, thank you very much for coming to Georgia and for giving your time to us. As I said, we are going to have very interesting perspective and we have Covert resilience and NATO strategic concept. So I want to make it very simple by saying this title, Forward Resilience and NATO Strategic Concept, contains three namely resilience, NATO strategic concept, and forwards. Let me take a few thoughts on each of these three. Resilience. It's not a secret that resilience is a very generic term. It is extremely difficult to define because resilience is everywhere. We have political resilience, military resilience, societal resilience, medical resilience, economic, you name it. It's everywhere. It reminds a little bit of the famous question the American judge Potter Stewart got in 1964 when he was asked whether he can define porn. And he said, well, I know it when I see it. So it's apparently very difficult to define. And even if you limit resilience to security policy, it is still an inflationary use of the term. NATO has this famous NATO 23 study, which is the base for a new strategic concept. In this study, NATO uses the term six, uh, 36 times you will find resilience. So we have a rough idea, as Mr. President said it, that resilience <clears throat> in, security mal uh, in security policy means the capacity to absorb external shocks. In that sense, it's the opposite of deterrence. Deterrence tries to prevent an, an action, and resilience uh, comes if the, if the action uh, or the harmful event already uh, occurred. So uh, this is the basic idea of resilience. Since resilience is so cloudy, we very often combine it with other terms. So some people speak about democratic resilience, which means the idea of, for instance, in NATO terms, to keep NATO as a political uh, unity. Um, indeed, we saw in the recent years an erosion of NATO's internal uh, cohesion. Interestingly enough, though, the current action of Russia is countering this trend. So actually, NATO is getting more united now. The same thing that happened, by the way, after 2014, when 2014 helped to unite NATO. So actually, at the end of the day, Russia, by its action in Ukraine, might get what it wants to avoid, namely a more coherent NATO, more forces in Eastern Europe. Um, so this might be the outcome. NATO also combines resilience with the term. NATO speaks about robust resilience. And this means the resilience of military, uh, government, and society. Um, <clears throat> and this also means that resilience is basically everywhere. So it's difficult to operationalize. In 2016, NATO had agreed on the uh, so-called seven baseline requirements uh, for resilience. And this is things like functioning government, secured energy supply, work in communications, and so on. So once again, very generic. Um, last year's NATO summit, NATO emphasized this, uh, uh, this principle by having a um, 
by agreeing on a strengthened resilience commitment and referring specifically to Article 3 of the NATO, of the Washington Treaty, which says that all the allies have to increase their capacity to resist an armed attack. Of course, resilience today is much more about um, an armed attack. So once again, not very specific either. And this is where we stand now in NATO. Second catchword, NATO strategic concept. As you know, NATO is in the process of formulating a new strategy. The old one is from 2010, so slightly outdated. And that would be an occasion, actually, to discuss resilience, to find some answers to these open questions, to make resilience a little bit more uh, specific. And there are a number of open questions also in NATO on what resilience means. For instance, uh, what are actually the specific threats for NATO with regard to resilience? Not generic, but specific. Do we have an idea? Um, actually, we don't. Because the question is, is, for instance, NATO only threatened by states or by individuals? Or is also the pandemic or climate change a threat to NATO's resilience? And is NATO responsible for the climate change? Maybe not. Second question. In the 2010 strategic concept, NATO defines three core functions, which is defense, uh, which is cooperation, partnership, and crisis management. The question now is, is resilience actually another core function? A fourth one? Or is resilience included in all the other ones? Currently in NATO, there's a consensus that resilience is the precondition to fulfill all the other three core functions. Some in NATO say, no, we should make resilience an, uh, a core function. Uh, another question is, what actually, which, which role does NATO as an institution have with regard to resilience, given the fact that resilience is first and foremost a state issue, a nation issue. It's even more, it's an, in, it is an individual issue. You are all responsible to, uh, to protect your computers with good passwords, which we all not do that much, at least me. So we are all responsible for, uh, for sort of resilience. So what is the role of NATO? Can NATO judge on other nations, NATO nations, if they don't fulfill their uh, resilience requirements? And are, is, is there any control mechanism we have in uh, NATO? No, we have. So all these questions would be urgently needed to discuss. However, the Ukraine crisis is covering everything in NATO. We are not discussing anything else but Ukraine uh, now for good reasons. And this is why these important questions are not discussed. Third point, forward. And now I think comes the interesting part for Georgia. Even if resilience is a national responsibility, it requires almost by definition international cooperation. You cannot be resilient as a state if your neighbors are not resilient. So therefore, resilience begins at home, yes, but it has to be shared uh, with others, and therefore it's the major issue for cooperation right now. And if NATO talks about cooperation on resilience, it first and foremost talks about cooperation with the EU, because the EU in Europe has those non-military elements of, uh, of the resilience which NATO um, does not have. However, cooperation cannot and must not stop at the borders of the EU or NATO. It has to be transported beyond these borders because also there, if the neighbors of EU and NATO are not resilient, NATO is not resilient either. So um, this is why uh, it's, it's a particular task for cooperation. And we have, a, I think we have a new trend, or not a new, but we have a trend in NATO paying more attention to those partners outside of NATO which are politically like-minded to democratic partners. NATO has a partnership concept since many years, which is actually, I mean, NATO's partner to almost everyone. Even Belarus is still officially a NATO partner. So we know that we have to reform this partnership concept to make it more effective. And one of the countries that require more attention 
are the politically like-minded ones, the democratic ones, like Georgia. And NATO could and should cooperate with these countries, um, particularly with regard to strengthening resilience. To give you a few examples, NATO has so-called counter-hybrid support teams to send them to a NATO ally if something, uh, something dangerous happens, if it's under threat. This support team also has been sent to Ukraine already. Um, the EU, by the way, also has a hybrid support team, so which means they are also possible to be sent to NATO partners. Second point, NATO has a so-called center of excellence, a COA, in Helsinki on hybrid threats, which means it's already based in a non-NATO country. Helsinki is not, or Finland is not a NATO country. Uh, this COA can and will and should cooperate much more with countries like Georgia and others, so again with the like-minded, with the political, uh, political, politically like-minded ones. We in NATO could change and we will change much more uh, best practice models on how to deal with uh, certain threats, with certain, with certain resilience problems. Uh, already f uh, uh, Sweden and Finland is very close to NATO, also both not NATO members, in exchanging on best practices on uh, potential resilience problems. Um, Romania has created a Euro-Atlantic uh, COA Center of Excellence for Resilience. So also this can and will work more together with partners outside of NATO. All this can increase the resilience of NATO partner countries, but even more, it can narrow the gap between membership and non-membership. And this is something which is important for Georgia and others. If NATO membership is not in the cards for years to come, and we can discuss for hours why this is not the case, it's not likely. But then the interest of countries like Georgia is to make, as the, as the former US uh, Foreign Secretary Madeleine Albright said once on the Baltic countries, to make the difference between member and non-member paper thin in the sense of sending the signal that the security of these countries is important for NATO. And in this sense, it's terribly important what is happening now in Ukraine. Ukraine is not a NATO member, we all know. It does not fall under Article 5, but NATO as an institution and individual NATO members have uh, sent very strong deterrence messages to Russia by saying, if you do this and that, you will have to face these and that consequence. Which means this increases the cost of any Russian action in Ukraine. Whether Putin gets the message, whether he acts anyway, we will not know. Or we don't know now, we will know one day. And if, and that's a very important issue, if NATO manages, or if we all manage to end this Ukraine crisis without using military force, without that Russia uses military force or NATO uses military force, then it would be a proof, it would be a huge step forward for the idea of exporting resilience, of exporting security, of exporting stability by NATO, even to non-NATO countries. And I think in that sense, it's terribly important what happens in the next weeks uh, in Ukraine. And on that happy note, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamp. Yes, it was really, really very important to underline that we don't have to combine uh, term of resilience with some other terms, and everybody is responsible for its own resilience level, like the computer passwords. And during the questions and answers periods, we will have more chance to talk about this. For the moment, I would like to invite for the panel Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, thank you very much, a great friend of Georgia, and uh, he has really an extraordinary knowledge about the issues that are going in Georgia and about Georgia's defense and security issues. Uh, welcome you again, and please, the floor is yours.
in Georgia and about Georgia's defense and security issues. Uh, we'd like to uh, and also say, um, seeing uh, President uh, Mark Velasquez uh, reminded me of my first visit to Georgia uh, in 2013 when I and I had the privilege to meet him there. And I asked yeah, kind of a uh, silly tourist question, but uh, I had the president right in front of me. Us extremely vulnerable, and it makes everything that much more difficult. So uh, I would encourage uh, all my friends there in Tbilisi to do everything you can to help protect that trust, earn that trust um, from your population. I'm not naive, uh, but uh, this, this helps. This is an important aspect of resilience. I had the privilege to visit Kiev uh, this past week. I was there with a delegation of five former U.S. ambassadors. Uh, you'll know some of these guys, Ambassador Vershbow, Herbst. Ground for uh, what's going on there. We met with uh, several different members of the RADA from different parties, as well as the Speaker of the RADA. We met with several different ministers, and I had an hour with uh, President Zelensky. Um, I came away from this meeting and from our visit, uh, first of all, impressed with the, um, the fighting spirit of the Ukrainians. Um, th this is not 2014. They, they are prepared. Uh, mentally, psychologically, uh, very determined. Uh, President Zelensky uh, impressed me. He is not confused about the threat. There has, of course, been some disagreements between Washington and uh, Kyiv about how the threat is perceived, how the Russian uh, threat will manifest itself. Is it going to be a, a massive assault all at one time, or is it going to be something that looks more like what they've been doing actually since 2008? Um, and President Zelensky has a very difficult task of helping make sure his country is prepared for what I think is almost inevitable. It's not inevitable, but it's almost inevitable, certainly increasingly likely, a new offensive by Russian forces into Ukraine. Uh, but he has to be prepared for that. But at the same time, his economy is getting crushed. Uh, and 
they're having to use up reserves just to keep their currency afloat. This is not a surprise to the Kremlin. In fact, I think much of what the Kremlin is trying to do now by deploying all these soldiers on Ukraine's border, in addition to the 30,000 plus that are already in Crimea and in Donbass, is to do exactly that, to put so much pressure on Ukraine that the economy suffers. And then the Kremlin will achieve one of its principal strategic objectives is to present Ukraine as a failed state and, then, and for the government to uh, collapse. This is part of their aim. And interestingly, my, my flight Tuesday morning from Kiev back to home to Frankfurt was a Lufthansa flight. During the middle of the night, the uh, departure time uh, moved up an hour and a half. So you can imagine uh, I was hustling when I did wake up uh, to get to the airport on time to catch the flight home to Frankfurt. And this is because Lufthansa and several other airlines are beginning to, to curtail their flights in and out of Ukraine, uh, to curtail the amount of time that they're actually sitting on the ground. So this pressure from Russia is affecting even the airlines. So this is the challenge that the president has. How do you maintain calm? And by the way, the head of the American Chamber of Commerce in, in Ukraine told me that several American companies were asking him, should we pull our people out? And of course, you know, the U.S. Embassy sent families home and several other embassies did that. So what uh, incredible pressure on the president of, of Ukraine. And so here, this kind of resiliency that uh, Carl was talking about um, requires leadership that is able to convince the population we are doing everything that's necessary. We're doing everything we can. We have friends coming in. There were three prime ministers in uh, Kiev just yesterday. And I think today, President Erdogan is visiting in Kiev. Uh, we had a large congressional delegation last week. So these things are helpful. And the endless flow of aircraft bringing in weapons and ammunition and other necessary supplies, this is part of it. But he's got to also do it in a way that businesses keep going, that airlines keep flying. Uh, what a challenge. And of course, everybody in Tbilisi is connected, uh, excuse me, or there too, but in Kiev is connected to the internet. Uh, and so I encourage my Ukrainian friends, you have to be proactive. If you want to protect your internet, you have to be proactive. You can't just tell people, make sure you're using the right passwords and that you're doing normal things. You have to be proactive. The, the RADA is not on a government website. It's separate, just like the parliament in most countries would be in a separate entity than would be the actual government itself. And of course, they are getting hit. Um, pressure from refugees. If and when Russia launches a new offensive into Ukraine, uh, there are probably going to be tens of thousands of refugees heading west, uh, not just in the western Ukraine, but probably on into Poland, uh, into uh, Slovakia, into Hungary. Uh, and, and this is going to create massive pressure on those governments and on the European Union. Now, again, this would not be a surprise to the Kremlin. Their, their uh, support for the Assad regime put over 3 million refugees on the road into Turkey and into Europe back in 2015. Uh, we all saw the uh, manufactured crisis of refugees uh, from Belarus pushing against the, the borders of Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland, creating massive pressure on populations and, and going after the unity of the alliance, but also the European Union. And I anticipate that this is also going to be one of the challenges uh, if Russia invades uh, again or expands what they're already doing. Let me close with this. Uh, Carl uh, mentioned uh, Germany. Germany is the key in all of this. Um, Germany is the key because of its moral authority, because of its economic power, and because of its geography, uh, its leadership inside the European Union. And of course, uh, with a new coalition government, it's, it's important for the United States to understand the, the domestic political situation in Germany, where the chancellor, no matter what he or she may ever want to do, in this case, Chancellor Schultz, it's still a coalition government. And so um, I think as the United States works with our uh, essential ally, Germany, on encouraging German support, uh, recognizing and understanding the nature of a coalition government will be important here. I will say that the Green Party has, has been tougher on Russia than I would have ever imagined in my life. Uh, the three strongest voices coming out of Berlin, of course, are Mr. Habeck, uh, Ms. Baerbach, and Mr. Omid Nordpur. Um, who have been resolute about um, uh, Russia's and China's um, human rights violations 
as well as the use of gas as a weapon. And fortunately, here in the last few days, I have seen some movement by the SPD, the, the uh, leading party within the coalition, the leading party, that uh, acknowledging publicly that yes, Russia is the aggressor, and yes, everything, everything is on the table. With that, uh, I'm uh, you know, very grateful for the chance to, to talk to you this morning, and I look forward to questions also and, and challenges. General, thank you very much. Yes, you mentioned trust, trust towards media, trust towards government, trust towards all the major actors who are going to be the suppliers of security and, uh, um, and more peace for, for its population, for its allies and partners, which is really a big problem, which is really a big problem, and we are facing the consequences of, of the lack of the trust nowadays. And thank you very much again. Dr. James, thank you very much for coming to Georgia as well from uh, George Marshall Fund. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Good morning, everybody. You just have to push the button. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm excited to be here with you today. Uh, allow me to first thank the University of Georgia. I saw Vignatio was here and my colleagues in the IR department for asking me to come and share ideas with you today. I'm, I'm excited by this opportunity because the focus of the conference, resiliency, for me, it's crucial in mitigating the contemporary threats we're facing. However, as Carl noted very, very well, is that this term has been used in many ways. It's used by everybody for about everything, and I'm not really sure what it means, but I'm gonna to try to use a definition and apply it today. For me, my remarks are based on deterrence is absolutely crucial as it's not a standalone policy. It must be a key component of national security, and in particular, a total defense policy. So that's the ideas I would like to share with you today, and I'll look forward to, uh, I'll look forward to your questions later. Okay, next slide, please. Let's see, do we have to turn this on? Da -da -da. There we go, there we go, got it. So first, uh, my, my outline, I'd like to talk about the threat, what we're facing today, a way to mitigate that threat, total defense, uh, the components of a total defense strategy, deterrence, uh, defense, and resiliency, and also the challenge that we are, some of the challenges that we are facing that Carl and General Hodges have already spoken about. So let's go to the threat first. What are we facing today? An assassination in Berlin, transnational criminal organizations smuggling weapons and illegals into Europe, China restrictions on Lithuanian exports and Australian exports, mine attacks against oil tankers, uh, drone attacks against critical infrastructure, uh, private military companies serving as proxies for various governments, a parliamentary fishing fleet operating in South China Sea. These are not isolated events. They are examples of synchroni uh, synchronized irregular warfare challenges that we are facing. They exploit our democratic values, uh, free speech, pluralism, political openness, to destabilize Georgia and, other, and NATO countries by eroding their power, their will, and their legitimacy, to, their legitimacy. To mitigate these tactics, I would argue we must improve our resiliency against them, but it can't be just to improve in politics, in social, in economics. It must be a component of a total defense strategy. Therefore, throughout this presentation, I'll provide examples of how other states have integrated resiliencies into their national defense strategies. So let's look at what total defense is. I know many of my colleagues are very familiar with total defense. I just want to give an outline to some people who are, who are not familiar with the term. But essentially, the goal of total defense is to deter an adversary by raising the cost of aggression and lowering the likelihood of success simply put. It mobilizes all civilian and military resources of the state so that an adversary is faced with national, national uh, resistance in the form of uh, invasion or if they try to occupy a country, uh, you know, passive resistance. This is not a new idea. It is a uh, security posture goes back to the, back to the Cold War. Numerous non-lying states used it then. Fran uh, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, Yugoslavia. Today, states, the Nordic states, the Baltic states, along with Singapore and Israel, employ total defense concepts. 
The key characteristic of this, of these, uh, of this is institutionalized collaboration between government entities, private sector, civil society, and the public. The direct involvement of civil society and public distinguishes total defense from traditional military deterrence and military defense. The concept of total defense relies on two key components. The physical component, which is a territorial defense, using a mix of irregular and irregular forces. And the goal of them is to uh, make it difficult for a country to attack, but then if they do attack, to be able to uh, mitigate, uh, attack their lines of communications, uh, and protect critical infrastructure. And another key part is the psychological, physical, psychological. Psychological is building societal resilience through public information campaigns, education, training, in active and passive resistance to an aggressor, to an adversary. A key challenge with total defense is that we don't know if it works. When do we know if it works? It's like deterrence. We don't know if deterrence works until it fails. So I'll look at countries like Finland, for example. They have a total defense strategy. Is it causation or correlation that they've not been attacked because they have a total defense strategy? I can't tell you that. I can tell you that many countries believe that it would be, it raises the cost for an aggressor, and that's a key aspect of deterrence. Some of our states since 2014, since the invasion of Crimea, have revived a total defense concepts uh, to mitigate what I consider the most important threats of the time, and those are hybrid threats. And this includes restructuring their conventional forces, their irregular forces, militias, uh, increasing public awareness of the threat. It's a key thing to get everybody involved to understand, to support the government, to support the armed forces during a crisis. And these countries have made particular emphasis on working on mitigating these hybrid threats, such as disinformation, um, cyber attacks, um, attacks on infrastructure. So they've been focused on improving these things. So again, what I'd like you to take away from this slide is that total offense involves all of society, private sector, government. It has to be linked and synced together. And of course, this is a challenge. But let's look at those three components of, before we look at the challenges, let's look at some of the components. How is resiliency linked to total defense? Well, first of all, I would argue total defense has three components, as you can see. Deterrence, defense, and resiliency. And deterrence just simply means that you have the capabilities and the ability to counter adversary attacks. And you can do this on many levels. I'll give you an example of the Ukraine. You've got Ukraine, something called the Cyber Army. And the Cyber Army is a bunch of private individual citizens, and they take down Russian websites. They attack uh, uh, websites in the occupied territories in the Donbass. So they show that they, we can do something about it. Deterrence, as we know, works when adversaries believe that if they launch an attack, they'll suffer unacceptable consequences. That's the key point. In hybrid threats, in the hybrid arena that we're facing today, and in contrast to traditional conventional deterrence, we must deter in multiple domains outside of military security domains. For example, we have to use all elements of national power, and that means diplomatic, information, military, economic, financial, law enforcement. The challenge with deterrence, as we often apply, is we look at conventional and nuclear forces. But now we're being attacked in these fields, these levels below conventional warfare, sub-state warfare, what people call the gray zone. If you're gonna have deterrence, you must be able to deter in those areas. That means you must have the capability and capacity to deter in those areas. Um, so what does that mean? I'll give you some examples of that. Um, now, I'll hold off my examples till later. Let's talk about defense, the second component. Defense is absolutely crucial you must improve protections of critical systems. For example, in Switzerland, they have an Office of Civil Protection, and they do vulnerability assessments and they conduct exercises. Um, another key component of defense is restructuring our civil military organizations to facilitate information sharing and facilitate a holistic, whole of society approach to security. For example, this is a function in Sweden of the Civil Contingencies Agency, which is responsible for that. The third key component of total defense is resiliency. And I'm gonna use the EU definition, which is the capacity to withstand stress and recover strengthened from challenges. Many uh, descriptions that we heard, I'll, I'm gonna use one and tell you, and, and we'll move from there. So the key thing about resiliency is we have to identify and mitigate societal vulnerabilities. Um, it, 
as General Hodges noted, if we don't improve those, it gives the uh, adversaries an opportunity to exploit us. So we have to strengthen, we have to identify the problem sets and mitigate those problem sets. That means you can do that only through engagement with all social partners. The key thing I'd like you to take away is that resiliency is a key component of deterrence and defense. You can't look at each one individualistically, which I think is a challenge. But now let me give you a total defense way of looking at things. For example, uh, mitigating disinformation in Lithuania. There's an independent NGO in Lithuania called Debunked EU. Many countries have these. Georgia has something very similar. But they identified uh, disinformation using um, artificial intelligence. Then the civil society group, which is called the Baltic Elves, it's professors, it's students, it's computer people, they get together with the Lithuanian government, they get together with the media, and they work together to identify who is putting it out and to counter that information. That's a good example of linking in, this, in the field of disinformation, linking together government, private sector, and civil society to mitigate a threat that we can, that takes advantage of a vulnerability that we have. So fostering toll defense. Make sense so far? I think so, I hope so. Let's look at some of the challenges, and General Hodges started talking about looking at these challenges. I don't want to go through all these, but I just want to give you a couple which I think are the most important. Um, as, General, as, as he just said, it's always a chance to learn, but sometimes it's difficult. And the biggest challenges or obstacles, I would say, to implementing a strategy at this time is, first of all, we have to understand the threat. How many people in Georgia or the rest of the, of the, rest of the countries that we live in, NATO countries of the West, understand the threat? understand what other countries are doing, what adversaries are doing to weaken us internally. So we've got to understand that. Because in contrast to conventional warfare, hybrid threats are executed by state and non-state entities in that gray zone between war and peace. It's below the level of interstate violence. It's easy to see when tanks come to a border. It's much, I would argue that Ukraine has been under attack for, um, for 10 years. Cyber attacks, disinformation. You could see a good example of this in the Crimea. Most successful operation you've seen in history, without firing a shot, the Russians took over the, with the Crimea. That's probably the most effective military operation we'll all be exposed to in our lifetime. So we have to, hybrid threats take advantage of the strengths of our societies, our openness, political pluralism. It's very difficult. But most of these attacks are taking place when what we would consider historically peacetime. We've got to look at things differently. Is it really peacetime? Is that the nature of the threat? Consequently, states don't realize they're being attacked. They don't realize they're attacked until they're too late. But some of the ways to do this, some of the countries have, have uh, tried to educate their population. For example, Sweden, they put out a, uh, every, every address in Sweden, every house in Sweden got a pamphlet called If Crisis or War Comes. Latvia did something similar, they call it 72 hours. What happens in the first 72 hours? So they're trying to get the public to understand the nature of the threat, to nat understand the nature of the threat and the adversaries. A second view is a challenge at a traditional view of security. It's predicated, as I said before, on conventional and nuclear deterrence. National security structure is closely linked to stopping conventional threats. It's not as closely linked to non-hybrid threats. How do we do that? How do we help mitigate the over, how do we make that challenge in looking at national security from a broader perspective rather than just a, a iron tanks and iron perspective? Well, to help overcome this problem, Finland, for example, has courses. They have a national security courses, and they bring in civilian and military leaders together to try to understand, here are the threats that we're facing, and here's how we have to look at mitigating them. How can we do that? Another key challenge, I think, is government coordination. One of the biggest problems is we do to ourselves. And a key challenge is a lack of coordination between various government entities. It's very difficult, as many of you know, you've worked in government, it, to overcome these, what I'll call cylinders of excellence, but bureaucratic stovepipes. We do this, we do that. State Department does this, Department of Defense does this. Everybody does one piece. How do we overcome those things? It limits our ability to look at the problem holistically and to devise strategies to mitigate them. I'm gonna give you a couple of illustrations how you can do that. Norway, for example, the Ministry of Justice, they're designated as a lead for civil protection and responding to national crises. In 2017, Sweden established an interdepartmental task force to coordinate efforts against disinformation, included Ministry of Defense, Foreign Affairs, Police, Justice, Defense Intelligence Agency. So they're trying to create structures within government to facilitate this holistic understanding of the threat. And I'll give you a practical example of how this works. In Estonia, in 2020, they passed something that people call the Hovre Law. 
So there, there was a, a bid for fifth generation technology, for example, in, in, in Estonia. And the Ministry of Commerce, Economic Affairs said they wanted to pick Huawei, a Chinese company with links to the Chinese government. They wanted to pick it because it was the cheapest and the best quality. Um, but the Minister of Security said, whoa, you're giving a state a firm that's very closely linked to the state, that has security implications. So uh, Estonia created a law that now any critical infrastructure has to be evaluated by an intergovernmental committee. So they're looking at these things not only from commercial point of view, but a security point of view. So it's an illustration of that. And the last challenge is the one on Bob, and General Hodges talked about that too. Um, how do we link and sync not only government entities, but civil society, the private sector, individuals? How do we do that? That's a real challenge because our structures aren't built for that. Many people, I used to work for USAID, we always worried about DOD. What are they doing? We didn't join, we didn't join uh, USAID to work with the military. How do, we, how do we take different missions to work together to improve our ability to defend ourselves? Well, here are some examples of what's been done elsewhere. Finland, you have government industry uh, briefings. They have a series of briefings. They bring industry to talk to the, uh, the government about the problem sets. Estonia worked with civil society um, and media providers to look at a media security law, cyber law. Czech Republic two years ago, they had joint military exercises uh, military industry exercises that include defense, energy, IT, healthcare, food. They looked at the problem holistically and they tried to bring in all those leaders to mitigate those problems ahead of time so they'd be aware of them. Again, numerous challenges. Can we learn? But we have a series of challenges. And allow me to conclude with giving you three things I hope you'll take away with. First of all, the nature of contemporary threats has changed. Hybrid threats have been used throughout history. They've always been around, but they're going to continue to increase in importance and relevance because of domestic instability, because of global interdependence, because of new technologies. Limiting the impact of hybrid threats on our national security is going to be a long-term security challenges. And that means we have to look at how do we structure our national security apparatus to deal with these attacks. I will just tell you that traditional military responses will not defeat non-kinetic, non-lethal threats. It's very challenging to do that. So the lines between war and peace have become blurred. It, we, have a, we have to have an integrated whole of strategy to deal with this new challenges. And by the way, if you look at what our adversary is doing, if you're Russian doctrine, if you're Chinese doctrine, they know they're already at war. They're already restructuring their militaries to look at these things. I would argue we should think about that same stuff. Total defense requires deterrence, defense and resiliency. They reinforce each other. They are not separate. You can't improve deterrence in Europe without improving resiliency. You can't. Well, you can, but it won't be effective. So we have to look at these things holistically and in totality. Otherwise, our adversaries will be able to achieve their strategic objectives. And finally, resiliency is the key because it decreases the social and political divisions which adversaries exploit. We must view resiliency more than simply as a way to respond to a crisis. It should be viewed as a comprehensive process which includes three parts. One, decreasing the likelihood of attack by increasing deterrence, maintaining government and societal functions during attack, and institutional learning so that after we're attacked, we learn and implement those lessons back into improving our resiliency. So there have been numerous examples of hybrid attacks on Georgia and NATO countries. So I would argue that to mitigate them, Georgia and our NATO countries and my country, we need to have a more total defense strategy. And that includes updating our views of deterrence. Does deterrence, as discussed in the Cold War and nuclear era, still effective? Do we, need some, do we have to look at that differently? We must establish a framework for looking at conflict below the threat of interstate conflict. Below that, we have to look at that. And above all, we need to have what my Russian friends would call novi mishlenyi. We need new thinking. We need to look at the security threats through a different prism. That means assessing our education, our training, our strategies. Are we built to do this? For decades, we focused on military responses to military provocations. But I would argue that adjustments to mitigating hybrid threats are going to be a challenge because of this. Our past always helped blind us to the future. So we are increasing, since our adversaries are increasingly operating in the gray zone, we have to be able to deter them. 
We have to be able to, it's not black and white. And if we keep looking at threats as black and white, we will continue to um, have our security adversely affected. The last thing I would like to leave you with, and, and a happy note, if you will, is that my institution, the Marshall Center, has just created a program on irregular warfare. We think it's so important that we create a program. The first iteration will be this summer in June. If anybody you want to talk to me about that afterwards, please do so. But we are looking at exactly these type of questions. We want to bring in practitioners to look at these questions and devise strategies so we can improve our collective holistic uh, uh, resiliency against the threats that we're facing. And with that, Constantine, thank you very much indeed. Thank you had really very interesting speech and yeah, uh, if we don't have a new thinking, then it won't be avoidable that we still stuck with the old version of maintaining peace and security, which does not work. And for, for a few times you have mentioned Finland and other Nordic countries uh, and the practice of 72 hours readiness total defense, territorial defense, psychological readiness. This is the most important thing to have uh, when you are neighboring Russia. But uh, what makes a difference is that Finland is the member of Nordic cooperation and other Nordic countries are supporting them very much to apply all of these uh, issues that you, that you mentioned. In case of Ukraine, in case of Georgia, we have totally different situation and those countries have to have to uh, respond respond to those challenges on their own, which is which is very big problem. And we are seeing in Ukraine right now that they are trying to build up some basics of total defense and this 72-hour readiness practice. So I think I think this is the issue that should be more more deeply elaborated for the future. Thank you very much again. Now I would love to uh, invite for our panel uh, Dr. Gustav Gressel, Senior Policy Fellow in the wider European program at ECFR Berlin office. I'm sorry, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for my uh, previous speakers who have successfully preempted uh, uh, a chunk of my speech. Um, and I, I have to admit, I couldn't have done it uh, in such a good way as he did. So I'm very happy that uh, the preemption was so successful. Um, so I, I'm here to, to advocate or to, to explain the rationale of the security compact. Uh, that is just an idea that my former boss, Mr. Niko Popesco, who is now a foreign minister of Moldova, when he was working at ECFR and I, tried to uh, stick into the heads of European policymakers why they should care for the security apparatus and for security assistance to our um, immediate neighborhood countries. And unfortunately, a lot of the rationale we put forward back then strategically has been um, uh, has been uh, proved true by the current situation in and around Ukraine. And now, actually, in the last minute, a lot of countries in Europe, unfortunately not all, but at least a clear majority, try to catch up uh, with, uh, with assistance, with deliveries uh, to assist and to bolster Ukrainian defenses. Um, and we have to concede that actually we have wasted eight years of discussing this instead of doing things. But uh, nevertheless, so what, what, what is the problem? Um, our general idea was, or the, the general problem, each of the security sectors in the associated countries, so those that made a dedicated European choice, or dedicated Western choice, Ukraine, Moldova, and, and Georgia, uh, faces problems in adapting to the needs of, as I explained before, a kind of total defense concept. Because predominantly, this, I mean, any country that emerged from the Soviet Union is pretty bad equipped to do so. The Soviet system was centralized. It was top-down planning. It rested on, uh, a, it didn't rest on local initiatives, on delegating uh, competences. And it was a very compartmentalized system. So uh, you had different pillars of administration of the political and party structures. 
and uh, they tried to uh, to cooperate as 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 little as possible because usually that entangled risk for the person involved. So breaking this um, breaking this culture, uh, refining and reforming these structures is an enormously difficult task. And there were in all these countries numerous iterations that tried to attempt them, some more successful than others. Uh, and there are still big holes to be covered. The problem is that a lot of also in the meantime, a lot of the assistance that uh, NATO and the EU in the military field and in the security field um, was, were offering to these countries was more structured to our own needs than to the needs of the neighborhood countries. That was participation in international missions, interoperability issues to send certain troops, for example, to Afghanistan or to Kosovo or to Mali. And I'm not saying that is generally a bad thing because interoperability helps and getting officers and getting military personnel in touch and acquainted to Western ways of tactical leadership of operating and operating alongside uh, uh, NATO allied forces is in itself a good thing. And it's in itself useful, but it doesn't solve the entirety of the equation. It doesn't solve the whole problem because it does not touch amongst national security planning and emergency structures. It does not create interagency cooperation. And in the military field, uh, a peacekeeping force operates under very different condition than a military force that is deployed to deter an open military aggression by a superior military enemy. Uh, so we need to get more sort of custom oriented, custom oriented uh, in in our defense systems because the survival and and this is regardless of the NATO membership perspective or the EU membership perspective. The EU membership perspective, of course, is important. I understand that, but irrespective of when and where a decision of that is made the survival of these countries as sovereign and independent countries is a key interest of all other European countries but Russia, independently from institutional arrangements. So what could have, what could the Europeans have offered? Uh, training, education, both inside uh, the partnership countries by refining curricula, by sending uh, trainers to training and, and education facilities, both in the intelligence, in the military sector, in the police, as well as admitting partner countries to, for example, the military Erasmus program within the EU that sends military officers from one army to the other that gets each of us acquainted to how a German officer to the Polish army or a Polish military facility or a, a, a Finnish, etc. There you can learn how do these bodies deal with pretty much the same problems that actually we face. War games, tabletop exercises, uh, especially to exercise the entire crisis response structure of partner countries. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of partner countries, so both Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, for example, have drafted new security doctrines, new security strategies, where they lay out how they want to deal with a threat if it emerges. The problem is a lot of these papers, state papers so far, and you need to train this, you need to train your way, you need to exercise your way you want or intend to respond to a crisis. And the best way of doing that is when you invite other countries who face similar problems, like for example, Estonia, like for example, Finland, like for example, Sweden, uh, and, and incorporate them into your exercises to make you aware of things you are actually not covering by your planning or make you aware of solutions they have found to it. You might, might find good to, to solve your pro practical problems as well. Then of course, military maneuvers and exercises that not train only peacekeeping scenarios, but hard, robust military defense issues. <clears throat> Especially here, I mean, we have a lot of armed forces that during the Cold War faced very similar problems of being a frontline state. Uh, and and the, the solution to this, uh, or the, the 
uh, how to how to train, how to organize your armed forces, how to how to deal with facing a superior conventional military enemy right at your border. They are they are not uh, an enigma. They are there, uh, and you can learn from these people. You can you can train together with these armed forces. Look at the Lithuanian, Polish, Ukrainian brigade, for example, where you are at least pre-COVID had a continuous. Um, shadow of exercises and common maneuvers that was very helpful for the ukrainians in in that context uh cyber security partnerships we have uh, uh we have emerging uh cyber security structures across the eu that deal with rapid response um, threat data exchange the problem is they do not have a mandate to cooperate with external actors so even if they for example, as Ukraine is also a test lab for Russian cyber uh, threats and the Russians test uh, cyber weapons first against Ukraine and then against EU member states, actually they would love to cooperate with Ukrainian cyber defense structures. They do not have a mandate to do so. Also, even for our defense uh, uh, preparations, that would be an advisable thing. Then the issue of intelligence cooperation in exchange for reform of the intelligence sector. So both in Georgia and in Ukraine and in Moldova, intelligence reform is a very tricky thing and it has been postponed over and over in Ukraine actually. Uh, uh, over the last years, quite some things have happened. Uh, in the legal phase, the laws need to be implemented. Uh, but one big incentive especially if you look into, into Ukraine, why intelligence reform has happened over the past years, was that it was a condition for intelligence cooperation with particularly US and British counterparts. And their intelligence is crucial for the Ukrainians to assess what is going on beyond their borders and beyond uh, uh, sort of the neighborhood they can with their technical means and with, with, with their abilities and capabilities observe. So here is a mutual interest to bring that together to facilitate intelligence reform by offering cooperation that increases both our understanding of the situational of the situation in the countries and of course the partners uh, understanding of the situation in the country that uh, it preempts or prevents misunderstandings or wrong reactions in the case of a Russian provocation that sometimes are just dedicated to cause reactions that they want to exploit. And of course, that increases the security of the partner countries. And last but not least, the delivery of military hardware and defense industrial cooperation uh, to modernize military equipment that is in place in these countries. And now if you look at the, the most recent UK, Polish, um, Ukrainian defense cooperation agreement, actually it's exactly that. The Brits have since 2019, especially in the field of, of, the, of the Navy, started to modernize Ukrainian naval infrastructure, naval training, very good initiatives. I, I'd love to have other countries joining that, um, but still here we are. And Poland, was, Poland is the most important defense, defense industrial partner for Ukraine because Poland has ample of knowledge in how to modernize Soviet legacy equipment to make it more useful because neither Ukraine nor Georgia and especially not Moldova will have the financial resources to overnight jump into equipping itself with fully interoperable Western style equipment that Moscow doesn't know and can has a harder time to predict and to deal with on the battlefield. Uh, but taking legacy equipment and modernizing it with different signal equipment, this different night vision equipment, uh, upgrading the armor, et cetera, that can, that can make a lot of difference in how useful this stuff is for your defense needs. And, and this knowledge now is sort of from our own defense modernization efforts we have put in, in our countries is now transferred, uh, in this case, to Ukraine. But still, um, I mean, we are talking, we had, saw now the initiation of the, of the um, uh, uh, European Peace Facility, which in theory should sort of second uh, the American foreign military aid program. So it's uh, a new money that uh, uh, is provided to the neighborhood countries to, um, 
to uh, uh, buy uh, uh, certain certain uh, amount of, of equipment. Unfortunately, of course, there's a lot of political discussions around which equipment they should buy or they should get and where the money should spend on. But um, I'm, I'm a bit sort of, I'm more optimistic on this. It's a start, you know, we, we start with mine clearing equipment and medical and medical stuff and we'll slowly progress uh, towards um, towards uh, towards other things because and that's also a lesson from this crisis and from the from the from the situation we we see and uh, happening around Ukraine uh, even if if some of the uh, deliveries of lethal aid are, are of course not changing the situation for Ukraine on the battlefield uh, they are important signals because each of these lethal aid deliveries, as, as small and, and, and unspectacular they might seem, uh, require clearance in Parliament. And a Parliament that clears lethal aid to Ukraine signals to the Russians that probably this Parliament will have no problem discussing pretty harsh sanctions in case you invade. So if you want to make your sanctions uh, threat uh, credible, uh, even, even a minor treat in a military field is a pretty good signal. Um, unfortunately, of course, this is not yet, especially in Europe, not yet cast in a coherent language, in a coherent strategic vision, in a coherent communication vis-a-vis -vis Moscow that would actually um, sort of make this not appear as this only the sum of all parts, but a, how, how should I coin it, a kind of awakening or rising up to the challenge. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you learn the, the problems, and with that, I, I leave it for the discussion. I guess there will be plenty of it, and um, thank you very much for, for listening. Gresson, thank you very much. It was really interesting to listen to you. And when you said that uh, in terms of NATO and EU perspective, uh, relations with partners. Yeah, NATO and EU, they both have a lot of partners, but they also have uh, integration aspirant countries. And you said that not only integration aspirant countries, but also member countries have this post-Soviet legacy in terms of equipment. But it is not only equipment, it is also uh, understanding of politics, uh, different sorts of affairs which uh, still remain to be post-Soviet style. And there is also another point that uh, uh, also member countries have this post-Cold War uh, thinking style, which makes the distance bigger and bigger between the aspirant countries and the member countries at the same time. But uh, yeah, and the main challenge comes to uh, cooperation with the external actors, non-member actors, which, which, which is causing a lot of problems in the end. And this was really nice to, to think about it. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to invite on the floor David Katsarava, the um, uh, civil uh, organization, anti-occupation movement, head of this organization, my good friend. Thank you, David, for coming here, and the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it's an honor for me to have a possibility to make a presentation uh, today for uh, for you, and uh, my special thanks for organizers uh, giving me this possibility uh, today. So, uh, as Mr. Kotes said, so I'm head of um, uh, head of uh, sorry, Ogurchal Tokats Award. Tick out at Sraud. Presentation Ogurchal Tokats Award. Yeah, Madloba. Uh, and uh, first of all, so I would like to uh, relate to you in a couple of words uh, about our organization, what we are doing. Uh, we now, uh, I, me and my friends represent the anti-occupation movement uh, strengths uh, in unity, uh, and we uh, established it uh, four and a half years ago, uh, 2017 in July. 
uh, and uh, the reason uh, the reason why the group of uh, civilians decided to uh, establish uh, this organization was uh, that uh, was the uh, collaboration uh, collaboration of uh, of our uh, government with uh, with Russian occupiers um, uh, and. Uh, uh, and we, we decided that uh, we we have to we have to act. Uh, so and now uh, uh, now I would like to argue that this. Oh, Marjuna Just me, you should act to it. I'm going to eat all my money. Okay, I got this. I got this. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, and um, we, uh, as, uh, as I already said, we established in 2017, and what uh, the purpose and the main goal uh, was uh, uh, that we have to, to act, and we, we, we don't trust anymore to, to the government. And what is our objectives of the movement? So, uh, to obtain a reliable and up-to-date information uh, on occupation to raise public awareness on occupation and its uh, influence on countries' uh, development, to improve civil society um, uh, and international partners' involvement in fight against uh, occupation and their influence uh, in state decision-making process uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Uh, oh, so uh, we, we are working on, a, uh, on, a base, on an everyday basis. So we are monitoring the occupation line and uh, Russian, uh, Russians uh, movement uh, every day. Uh, we started uh, four and a half years ago and I can say that uh, only uh, one month of quarantine uh, when, uh, two, year, uh, two years ago when the pandemic started so uh, stopped us. Uh, so otherwise, so we, we are every day at the occupation line uh, and um, uh, and trying to uh, to disturb and to uh, create a discomfort to Russian occupiers while occupying our uh, territories. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, the model of our activism? Uh, so, voluntary participation uh, and organization operates uh, only with uh, crowdfunding. Uh, so, there is no paid uh, uh, staff uh, and. Um, uh, all expenses uh, uh, so are, are oper absolutely operational. Uh, fuel, equipment, uh, and everything connected to, to our uh, monitoring missions, uh, which we are providing uh, every day. Uh, all uh, uh, all uh, inf uh, all information obtained uh, during patrolling uh, of the um, uh, of occupation line territories is absolutely open. Um, and uh, we uh, and uh, we are sharing is uh, with relevant state institutions. Uh, organization operates with uh, anybody interested in contribution um, contribution uh, into the occupation uh, and sharing values of a democratic sovereign country independently of their political or other um, uh, affiliates. Um, so. Uh, our milestones. Uh, uh, there were uh, some milestones uh, within these uh, four years, which uh, which are very important uh, for our organization and uh, in our uh, activities. Tatuna Shvili case. I think that most of you uh, know this uh, tra tragical case uh, when Russians um, uh, kidnapped uh, kidnapped our uh, soldier. Uh, then tortured and killed him. Uh, so, and our moment uh, was 100% uh, involved in all the processes of getting uh, getting back him um, uh, to an occupation, uh, non-occupied non uh, part of uh, our uh, country. It was a uh, it was a really um, tough uh, period and tough case. Um, I thought see 11 months of civic uh, civil uh, res uh, resilience. Uh, so uh, I have to uh, relate in a couple of words uh, about a uh, This uh, this is uh, um, uh, this is an example uh, how uh, civil activism. Um, uh, can uh, can be very effective. Uh, uh, 
four years ago, uh, in 2018, 7th of November, uh, Russians uh, started uh, continued uh, borderization uh, process in Atotsi, uh, Atotsi village. Uh, so you know that uh, uh, the creeping borderization and creeping occupation of, uh, of our country, of Georgia, uh, is not stopping. Uh, so it's continuing on an everyday basis. Uh, and this was uh, one, uh, one of um, the stage of, of this uh, process. And when, when we got this uh, information, so we, we went directly uh, to, uh, to the offense, uh, which was uh, uh, installed by, by Russians, and they were uh, uh, still working there. Uh, and we said, uh, and we appealed to them uh, that we will not give them a uh, um, possibility to continue borderization. Eleven months we we uh, lived uh, we lived uh, in this uh, village, and every day we stood at defense, uh, not giving the pos uh, uh, occupiers uh, possibility to continue borderization. And uh, we can say that uh, uh, not only in Atotsi uh, it was stopped, but uh, alongside of the whole occupation line. Uh, there was no one uh, meter of fences added uh, to, um, uh, to that uh, occupation line within uh, this 11 month. And uh, uh, it was continuing until the uh, government, um, uh, government helped uh, occupiers. Uh, yeah, it sounds wild, uh, I know, but uh, in fact, it happened. Uh, it happened in this way. Um, Nineteen uh, in 2019, 19 of uh, October, uh, a police uh, policemen uh, uh, um, uh, created a wall uh, between occupiers and uh, civil activists, and uh, only after it. Uh, uh, Russians, uh, Russians continued uh, borderization, uh, uh, and uh, this was uh, the proof. Uh, uh, the proof that uh, if uh, uh, if a civil activists and government and society uh, is uh, united, so uh, reunited, uh, uh, then uh, then it's very easy for for occupiers to deal with uh, with, with with us. Um, okay, I would like to continue because if I will start to speak about uh, this, this case, I, I will take all your time. So, um, uh, sorry. Mm, uh, then, Gavrilov case and following public awareness wave. Uh, then, social and human rights campaigns for kidnapped and affected population. Uh, as you know, uh, Russians are kidnapping, uh, kidnapping uh, our. Um, citizens uh, almost every day. Uh, I will show you the figures uh, a, a little bit uh, later. Security system uh, uh, piloting uh, for uh, affected uh, population, source button project. So uh, uh, this is the project, and uh, I have to uh, uh, say uh, in a, a more detail uh, about this. Uh, this uh, source button project is the project which was created, uh, 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 was created um, uh, by uh, uh, by our uh, organization for the uh, people who are uh, who are uh, in a risk group uh, of kidnapping. So uh, who are uh, who are going every day close to uh, occupation line and uh, and to uh, who are kidnapped uh, and who uh, have been kidnapped um, uh, several times uh, by occupiers. This is a special device. Um, uh, like a GPS tracker, and we divided. It. Uh, unfortunately, we we were able uh, to purchase uh, only 55 uh, devices, uh, and we divided it uh, uh, between um, 40 uh, 40 villages. And we, uh, this is device uh, uh, which is uh, G uh, like GPS tracker has two only two buttons. So one of uh, uh, this button is uh, source button uh, and. And uh, when um, when the um, uh, person who is under the risk of kidnapping uh, uh, 
uh, pushes this uh, source button so we are getting exact information uh, exact information uh, of the place from which uh, he could be uh, he could be kidnapped of course we cannot save uh, the, this uh, this person because uh, uh, because we, we cannot be at the, uh, at the same time um, everywhere uh, but uh, we, uh, we we are getting the information exact information that um, I, I would like to underline now, and, uh, now that uh, occupiers are kidnapping our uh, citizens mostly uh, in 80 percent of, of these cases mostly now from the territory which is uh, controlled by our uh, government so I mean that occupiers are crossing uh, the occupation line um, and uh, going uh, onto the uh, territory which must be controlled by our government and kidnapping then uh, our citizens uh, from this territory and after this uh, kidnapping so they are making a photos on uh, already occupied site uh, and then so they are starting some like a process uh, that uh, uh, citizen of Georgia has crossed this so-called uh, state border etc and then uh, uh, then so uh, uh, after two, three days uh, uh, procedures, so uh, giving them uh, back to us. Uh, so this is a, a proof. Uh, uh, this source button give, uh, give us, uh, gives us uh, the uh, proof that uh, Russians are crossing uh, this line. And uh, this is the uh, continuing uh, and creeping aggression. Um, and so we, uh, we can use it, uh, we can use it uh, against, uh, against them. Uh, and also uh, the next point was a uh, uh, fear zone um, uh, fear zone identification uh, uh, fear zone identification so um, uh, one uh, sli two slides later I will I will uh, speak more detailed about the uh, fear zones what does it mean uh, and this is uh, the uh, term uh, term in which uh, uh, which was Created uh, uh, by us, and so it has a um, uh, it has a, a very uh, deep uh, meaning. In fact, uh, you see in on that slide, uh, what do you think is the most important issue facing Georgia at the moment? And this is the uh, period 2008 2019. Uh, this was my research um, that the unresolved conflicts as a priority problem, and it was highest priority in 2008. But uh, then, uh, the, then this priority was decreased, uh, um, decreased catastrophically. Uh, but after 2017, when uh, when we started um, our activities, uh, uh, society uh, w uh, was uh, much more involved and is much more involved in, in this now process. And you see that it started to to, uh, to increase now. Uh, statistic of kidnappings, uh, 2008 to 2021. Uh, so uh, usually we, we are uh, we are dividing this uh, statistic in uh, three parts uh, and in three time periods: 2008 and 2012. This is the first period when the, this is the hot period after the uh, after the war, uh, and. Um, I can say that in this uh, very difficult uh, uh, period, uh, uh, the cases of kidnapping uh, uh, were, uh, in average, uh, in average, uh, 80 cases uh, per year. Uh, then, after uh, from 2012 to. Uh, uh, 2012 and 2000 in the period of uh, 2017, uh, the uh, quantity of uh, uh, kidnapping uh, kidnap cases uh, in, uh, was increased, uh, and it was uh, in average 140 per year. <coughs> uh, and from 2017 uh, until today, now uh, this is the period uh, when. Uh, uh, when we started um, actions um, uh, at the occupation line on as i said on everyday uh, basis and the society was uh, involved and uh, is involved in uh, all, all our activities uh, the 
uh, quantity started uh, to uh, to decrease, uh, and nowadays, um, nowadays the, this uh, figure comes uh, close to the figure of uh, 2008, uh, 2012. So, in average, we have uh, approximately 75, uh, 80 uh, cases uh, within uh, within the year. So, uh, during the last two years, uh, the, these cases were uh, decreased to uh, 67 and um, 63. Uh, uh, kidnapping cases uh, per year. Uh, statistic of uh, borderization, so 2008-2021, and uh, I will divide uh, this uh, time period uh, also in uh, three parts. Uh, in 2008-2012, uh, <clears throat> Russians uh, uh, made a borderization uh, approximately of four and a half uh, Kilometer approximately uh, 1.4 uh, kilometer uh, per year. So I got uh, is uh, <laughs> showing uh, uh, me that uh, <laughs> I have to I have to uh, finish uh, uh, here. And but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, uh, I'm not able to. Uh, to explain, to relate uh, all what I wanted uh, uh, to speak about, um, I will uh, I will speak now about the new plans of uh, Russians, and I will then uh, finish. Okay. Uh, so uh, approximately one month ago, uh, one month ago, we uh, we got the information uh, which we made and opened that Russians are, uh, Russians intend now uh, to start new borderization and new occupation uh, process uh, uh, of the territories which uh, are not uh, which are not. Um, uh, 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 as a, uh, we, which we cannot uh, we can uh, consider as uh, as a result of 2008. This is new territories, uh, approximately to, uh, 200 square kilometers, which Russians uh, are already started to occupy. Uh, this is uh, this is very important issue. I'm sorry that I cannot uh, uh, finalize my uh, uh, my presentation. But anyway, uh, thank you so uh, so much for your attention. It, it was important for me to have this possibility to relate to you about uh, uh, about uh, the occupation process uh, uh, in Georgia uh, and if you all have a, any questions so I will be more than happy to answer it thank you very much thank you David for your presentation and also thank you very much for what you are doing because you and your organization are the entity t which has the most most vulnerable and most outstanding information about the things going on on the on the occupation line and as you mentioned you started your activities because there was a lack of trust towards the government and unfortunately this trend is still is going on and hopefully you will find a lot of successes in your future endeavors and I, I thank you very much again for coming. Now, we unfortunately, we ran out of time for, for a bit, but we still, have, uh, we still have time before our break to collect uh, questions from the audience. We also have online questions, and uh, our online guests are also here to, to answer our questions. I will uh, start with one question, because the question came online also from our friend, Lasha who is not here due to health issues, and his question was directed towards uh, uh, General Hodges. What do you think about Georgian defense forces are adequate in terms of number and capabilities to the major Russian threat of military invasion, and if not, what steps must be done to increase Georgian military resilience? Maybe, General, you will ask, answer this question, and meanwhile, we will collect the rest of the questions in the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you. Obviously, it's a critical question. Uh, Georgia, just because of the size of the population, obviously will never be able to have an armed force that is affordable and sustainable uh, that alone could stop uh, a Russian attack. So that means you have to make the most of not only the population and resources that you have, but also your geography. Uh, the idea is not new of making yourself indigestible. 
uh, and, and doing things that would make it so costly uh, and would take so long for Russian Federation forces if they were to launch uh, another attack uh, in, into Georgia. That means you also need to have a uh, rapid mobilization of uh, reserves, uh, territorial forces. Uh, I would encourage uh, a very close look at what Finland does, the, the culture as well as the style of how Finland, which has the same challenge, a uh, small population, uh, right next, and, but yet you're right next to the bear. Um, the way I've seen Finnish exercises, the way that they mobilize, how quickly they get troops equipped into the field is impressive. And, and uh, I think in the past, uh, former Georgian defense minister and chief of defense have visited uh, Finland, have worked with them, and also, by the way, with Estonia. Uh, I think this is a good model for Georgia. Uh, but also, last thing is the um, making sure that are offering to the United States, for example, and to the UK, uh, be as inviting as possible uh, for the United States Navy, the United States Air Force to uh, to want to come there for exercises, uh, perhaps infrastructure, um, storage, um, the airfield, do things to make it easier for the Air Force to go in and out of there, and also uh, this. Uh, the port project at Anaklia, that would have done a lot, I think, uh, a base that is more appealing, frankly, for the Navy to come in there more often with larger vessels. Um, these are the kind of things I think also is contribute to Georgian uh, defense and security. Thank you, General. Now we can move towards the audience. I would, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself and to whom, to whom your question goes. Hello, everyone. I am Mehdi Pavlovishvili the... from Ilya State University, Professor of Political Science. Thank you very much, all the guests, for the interesting presentations. And I have the questions to the uh, doctors. Excuse me, I don't remember the names. So uh, we talked a lot about the resilience. Uh, thank you very much for all the types and explanation what they mean. But I think we have to mention another type of uh, resilience. This is the resilience of Russian aggression. So uh, we and you uh, said to us that the countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and uh, Moldova, the more they uh, become like-minded to West and means that democratic states, the more resilient becomes the Russian aggression. So, and I agree with uh, Dr. Gressel that the defense development and improvement for this type of countries we represent is very important, but this is the long-term project. For the short term, the problems and challenges we, we face and right now Ukraine faces, what is your short term or mid term advice for the countries like us to overcome Russian aggression? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think there is no short term means to overcome Russian aggression. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a political decision of the political leadership in Russia. I mean, Russia is not aggressive per se in the DNA. It is just that you have a leadership which has decided, and you know the famous quote of Putin that uh, the biggest, in his view, the biggest drama of the 20th century was the demise of the Soviet Union. So he tries to do two things uh, to reestablish as much of the former grandeur of uh, Russian Soviet uh, uh, whatever empire, since he knows, by the way, that he is militarily uh, inferior to any coalition, be it NATO, US, whatever, he uses, and this is absolutely consequential, he uses uh, the means of the weaker, which are all the hybrid uh, um, um, means you have. Uh, you will not end this by declaring anything or by trying to convince him. It's interestingly enough, by the way, that apparently Putin thinks in only in his lifetime, uh, ho uh, in his lifetime horizon, because most of the measures he does, 
Ukraine 2014, Ukraine now, in the long run harms Russian development. It costs a huge amount of money economically and so on. And Russia is in the long term decreasing anyway because it has only two products on the world market, which is basically weapons and energy. This is not a good business model for a digitalized future. So, but apparently he thinks only in his lifetime. So you will not be able to convince him of the opposite. But by, as just has been said, by preparing, by make yourself undigestible, by uh, coming closer as much as possible to Western institutions, uh, creating the feeling in NATO and elsewhere, we cannot leave them alone. The same what's happening now with Ukraine. This can improve your security situation. And I think this is the only thing you can do. You cannot do in anything on the Russian side on this. Thank you. Would you like to answer, or we can go to the next question? Well, well, just two things because I think sort of Ukraine will be will be discussed uh, or will, will be in the interest of, of a lot of them. On the short run, there are basically two things you can do. Uh, the first is credible harsh sanctions to increase the cost for Russia and make this as credible as possible. And the second thing is to ramp up NATO's defenses and military posture on the eastern flank, because that's also something, if you look into the Russians' demand to NATO, that Putin doesn't like. Uh, and the more he has the impression that whatever he's pushing for makes his strategic situation worse uh, than not pushing, makes may make him think twice about pushing. This is These are the only two short-term things we basically have. Uh, on the longer run, and again, we have wasted eight years discussing, uh, supporting the neighboring countries to become more resilient. Uh, I mean, no country in Europe, no single country in Europe is in a position where it can perfectly defend itself against the Russian military threat. But we also know, despite of sort of the ongoing rambling and sort of continuous aggression and aggressive policies of Russia, that when it comes down to picking a fight, Putin picks the fights he knows he can win at costs he can calculate. And on this thing, you can, you can adjust your measures. You can raise the possible costs and you can decrease the predictability of victory. I mean, yes, Russia can, under all circumstances, and regardless what kind of weapons we ship to Ukraine, win a land war against Ukraine. But the more the Ukrainian armed forces operate differently than the post-Soviet armed forces, the more they have weapon systems that do not operate in ways of weapon systems the Russians exactly know, down to the technical characteristics, the less likely Moscow can calculate at what risk for men and material such a victory will come about. And, and here we, can really, we really have means in our hands to alter the calculation. We just have to, we just have to develop the political will to do so. Thanks. Thank you very much. We can take one more question from the audience and then we shall please. Good morning. My name is Michael Kajomadze. I'm reader in politics at the University of Oxford. Uh, just one short question, if I may. Russia is aggressive because it's strong or because it's weak? Nice question. So what do you think? Um, Russia is uh, managed by a bandit. Uh, Putin saw this like a mafiosi or some, some like this guy, yeah? And I will answer you uh, very short. Russia is a country uh, which understands only one language, language of power. Power and force. Would you add something? All right, then we can close this uh, uh, panel. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time and we are having more guests waiting for us online. Uh, but we will conclude uh, all the findings together. M meanwhile, uh, this panel was very interesting in terms of uh, its uh, final sentence, for example, that Russia is understanding on only the power, power language. But this is not the only thing we can offer to Russia. We can offer 
we can offer our own, own resi resi resilience that, that makes uh, states and countries more more stable and more ready for the for the challenges that are coming from the bad side of the world and at the same time we are having eu and nato and its partners and the partners uh, which are respecting the um, standards and uh, uh, let's say let's say um, respecting the um, rules that are inside the, the, those organizations and which are which are willing to become uh, more and more close partners but unfortunately we are seeing that this partnership is not that strong to avoid the ongoing situation as we are having in Ukraine or what we have had uh, since 2008 in Georgia. Otherwise, uh, there is also the lack of trust to, towards our own governments, trust towards our media, towards our politicians. We don't really understand what they are doing and why they have decided to take this manner of actions and affairs with its own people and other partners. But the only thing we understand that Russia is benefiting a lot out of this behavior. And we have to set our own passwords on our own computers to make them more secure, as uh, Dr. Carl said, and I totally agree with this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here. Da David, you wanted to yeah, add something. I, I want yeah. uh, to add something. Uh, the experience shows that any discussions uh, and uh, any compromise, uh, Russia understands uh, the weakness. Uh, and uh, only after uh, the, uh, the whole world will show to Russia that, uh, the, uh, and will speak with Russia with the language of power, after it so we can start discussion with them. Uh, if if uh, this does not happen, it's, my, it's of course my, my opinion, but uh, uh, but I think that uh, many of us uh, will agree with uh, with this point. Uh, only after it, uh, when when Russia sees that the uh, world is ready to show its power, only after it uh, will be possible to speak with Russia. Before it's over. Hopefully, we are at this stage yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank exactly. you very much, ladies and gentlemen.